Known as the Boomerang Creek Tunnel, it was two years in construction and links the Mangrove Creek Dam with Wyong Creek, a major tributary flowing into the Marty Dam. Gosford is supplied with water from the Mangrove Creek Dam and Wyong from Marty. The decision to construct the tunnel came after the 1979-81 drought, which at one stage threatened existing water supplies. The 80-ton boring machine has been chipping away through the sandstone and shale at an average of 120 metres per week. Today it broke through the last few metres of rock. At the final breakthrough in the three-metre tunnel at Yarramalong, miners who had been working on the project couldn't contain their excitement. The first man through the gap was Jason Ranging, a miner whose father was the tunnel supervisor and died only a few weeks ago after he suffered a heart attack on the job. And as a further mark of respect, Deputy Premier Wal Murray handed over his public works tie. Mr Murray says the tunnel at its deepest point is 300 metres underground and is one of the country's major engineering feats, even more outstanding than the Snowy Mountains scheme. An enormous achievement. It's got a number of firsts. It's a, the first uh, long distance, 11 kilometre channel in, uh, tunnel in one distance. The fact that it comes out three inches on a bend is also a phenomenal achievement and uh, the company, uh, Koya, have got to be congratulated on a great job, well done. In six months' time, the $30 million tunnel will be flooded permanently. It will discharge into Wyong Creek in times of drought or for servicing. It's expected the tunnel will later be complemented with an overland pipe that will pump water from Wyong Creek in floods to be stored in the Mangrove Creek Dam. Darren Curtis for NBN News. The news started to leak an hour before the official announcement, media from across the country jamming the switchboards of the Hunter players. Well, there's no guarantees of that. I mean, we're being told that. Uh, but we're not being offered anything on a platter. Trade Hall Council Secretary Peter Barrick and Don Laverick from Carrington Slipways heard their worst fears confirmed at four o'clock as they listened to the press conference from NBN. I have pleasure in announcing that uh, the Cabinet met earlier today and has decided to select the Amicon Consortium's bid Defence Minister Beasley was at pains Australian to point out Navy. what Newcastle would get out of an Amicon win. $700 million worth of contracts are promised, supposedly 40% of the work. If New Zealand is excluded, Amicon has apparently agreed to launch four ships in Williamstown and four more in Newcastle. What was critical was in the first instance the difference in price, some $350 million, and that, I might say, is the minimum difference in price. The, Don Laverick, uh, however, was not impressed by the argument that he'd lost almost certainly the biggest bid, contract of his life because his offer much, was uh, too expensive. Money. I believe the price difference that was quoted is the equivalent uh, in difference in value in the ships. Others who played big roles in the frigate bid were equally disappointed by the announcement. Uh, we bent over backwards to ensure that the investment climate was right uh, for the government to make the right type of decision. Uh, so certainly uh, one of extreme disappointment. <coughs> Both angry and sad. Yes. The decision will reflect against the government. And the government and Australia are the losers in it. I can see the federal government suffering quite enormous setbacks for many, many years to come. No one is going to believe that this uh, decision wasn't contrived politically. I've arranged to see the Prime Minister about it, to see that we can get uh, whatever deal we can out of it to maximise our involvement. Earlier this year, the state government announced it was lifting the charge for a bed in a shared ward in a public hospital to $170 a day. Since the start of Medicare in 1984, the states and the Commonwealth have always been able to come to an agreement to completely cover the charge. But this time, Canberra would not relent and limited the declared benefit to $160 a day, leaving the $10 gap. 
while it's a bone of contention which was aired weeks ago, now that people are beginning to have to find the difference from their own pockets, rumbles are beginning to emerge. Health insurers are not reporting any major complaints, but in a survey today, some said they are expecting people will begin to complain once the bills come rolling in. However, the region's biggest, NIB, said they'd not had any complaints. And the administration of the Royal Newcastle Hospital said that while there had been a few grumbles, there had been no written complaints, and the matter was not, to them, a major issue. Over the years, the graveyard on the floodplain of the Hunter River has been covered in silt, building up and up for nearly 200 years. Local conservationist Dion Ackland claims the excavation of the uniting church-owned Wesleyan burial ground in Oakhampton Road contravenes the New South Wales Heritage Act. This act stipulates that no one must disturb or excavate land to expose a relic dating back earlier than 1900 without a special permit. The work that's being done hasn't been done correctly and would probably cause irreversible damage to the site, which is extremely significant in the Hunter Valley. It's believed many of these local graves hold a wealth of local history. This one belongs to two children and the wife of William Arnott, believed to be the founder of the famous Arnott Biscuits. Local knowledge says he first opened a factory in Morpeth before moving to Newcastle in the 1860s. Mr Ackland says of removing soil from the graveyard, some old hand-carved headstones and intricate wrought iron has been exposed for the first time in centuries and this sudden exposure to the elements could damage important historical remains. He also says that more damage has been done by cows grazing through the burial ground. But cattle owner Ron Crawford says the gravestones dating back to the 1800s are a popular spot for tourists and without his cows the graveyard would be completely overgrown. Though he declined to comment on camera, he did say that since he owns the surrounding land, he's taken an interest in the graveyard, attempting to keep it safe and neat for visitors. The Uniting Church is due to discuss the matter next week, and, and an investigation has been launched on behalf of the Heritage Council of New South Wales. Elizabeth Stephen emigrated to Australia 70 years ago with her husband and daughter. Today her extended family, staff and residents of Mayfield's Cara Nursing Home paid a special tribute to the effervescent old lady of song. I used to sing a lot. Sing a lot. That's my, my, my life. My husband was a great violinist and I was a piano player. In later years, Mrs. Stevens swapped her piano for a more modern, high-tech form of entertainment. I used to go and play in housing, and I used to go and play the poker machine, but I can't feel them here because... <laughs> now she is still handy with the knitting needles and at cake cutting. Well, here goes. Oh, look at that. I won't do any damage to you, but here goes. And I might be here next year again to cut another one. Happy birthday to you. And at the grand old age of 103, she is still full of life. But I don't see it anymore. $3 million will be spent at Gosford Hospital doubling the obstetrics capacity with a new 32 beds and a further 88 beds will be split between orthopaedic, surgical and intensive care. Excavation work has already begun adjacent to the surgical and emergency sections and is expected tenders for construction will be called next week. Once completed, the extensions will provide jobs for another 250 staff plus surgeons and specialists. Health Minister Peter Collins says the new work will do away with many of the hospital's ageing buildings. 
it'll be completely linked, it'll be integrated and really it'll, uh, it'll tie the hospital together, it'll bond it in a way that has never occurred previously and I think it'll consolidate services that have been scattered through a lot of very old buildings. The first babies will be born in the new maternity section in late 1991. The additions will also incorporate an emergency helipad, eliminating the need for helicopters with critical patients to land on the nearby golf course. Mr Collins also announced extensions for one of the area's largest private hospitals. The MBF-owned North Gosford Private Hospital will spend $23 million installing 22 new maternity beds and another four intensive all care there. units. And uh, I think it's terrific to see that the private sector is keeping pace with the public sector. In other words, they are almost uh, matching and complementing the services which the public sector is putting in here, the government's putting in. The extensions will be done in two stages with the first schedule to begin next Monday. Darren Curtis for NBN News. everything absolutely properly, everything in front. And that's what we want to do, to make sure that this... The estate, known as New Lambton Gardens, is situated on one of the last freehold titles in the suburb. When it was originally announced that it would have a special brick veneer covenant, the Mine Subsidence Board withheld approval for this particular building technique. The method, claimed to be indistinguishable from a normal brick house, uses a steel frame with galvanised steel locking rails and clay bricks. The developer, the consulting firm and the Mine Subsidence Board agreed that the building system should be tested by the university's engineering department to see if this type of brick veneer would be acceptable for mine subsidence areas. The new brick veneer system proposed for the subdivision proved to be satisfactory. The Hunter Economic Development Council will act as an advisory body to the state government on issues affecting the region. Chairman of the council is David Boyd, general manager of Port Waratah Coal Services. Other members include Peter Rundle, Peter Barrack, Rob Shannery and Brian McGuigan. The eight local men are joined by the Director General of the Department of State Development, Dr John Saunders. According to Premier Nick Reiner, the Council will be the only development body in the region recognised by the State Government. This leaves the previous Hunter Development Board in limbo, without government financial backing. However, Chairman of the HDB, Alex Young, says the Board will continue its operations and is willing to work with the new Council, although he is critical of the State Government's role. Uh, if it's being entirely funded by government, if it uh, is being serviced by public servants, if it's answerable to the Department of State Development, in Macquarie Street, uh, I have great difficulty in understanding what people mean when they say that it will be independent. I believe that's not the case, uh, but that doesn't mean to say it can't do a job within the region. Mr Griner admits that similar councils established in the past have been all talk and no action. And although he says he can't guarantee this one will be any different, he says it has the right mix of human resources to get results. They're all people of great experience and uh, with great records. It'll be up to them to actually produce uh, some wins, some runs on the board. And uh, I make no bones about it. Uh, that is the test. If it's simply a talk fest, uh, it'll be a waste of time. According to Mr Griner, the Development Council's first task is to pick up the pieces after the loss of the frigate contract and ensure the region gets the work promised by Amacon and the Federal Government. Now, there's still an awful lot of work to be done to see that uh, as many of the economic benefits that have been so uh, reliably promised by uh, uh, Amacon and by the Federal Labor Party, that uh, at least some of those benefits uh, actually do occur. Another urgent concern for the Development Council is the future of the state dockyard site. Jody McKay for MBN News.
Macquarie Council offers employees water views, pleasant working conditions and access to an enviable lakeside lifestyle. The thing it doesn't offer is lucrative, above award salary packages. It seems that in these harsh economic times, money is the greater inducement. Well, we've lost uh, three in the uh, health and building department, we've lost another two or three in the engineering department and there's a possible two more that may go and these are senior people, not, not easy to replace. Regular advertising in the national press has drawn a blank, not surprising to Alderman Welsh, who says the council is simply not in a competitive position to attract or even hold top level staff. I know that in, in other council areas uh, the packages that are being offered are more attractive to the people that uh, leave Lake Macquarie, obviously. Lake Macquarie Council has now vowed to carry out an urgent review of its salary system. Amongst the options, performance-based contracts, an overhaul of the regrading system and inclusion of cars in executive salary packages. In the meantime, the ratepayer may well feel the sting of the staff crisis with Alderman Welsh predicting delays in some council services as understaffed departments struggle with the workload. In 1985, the five hectare bushland site was handed over to the local Duck and Jack Land Council under the Aboriginal land rights legislation. The Land Council earlier this year decided to develop the area into a 150 site tourist van park. An Aboriginal spokesman says the development would have only 30% permanent residents and would be treated as a complete business enterprise, establishing an economic base for the Land Council and help Aboriginals remove the stigma of being seen as relying on handouts. A spokesman says the park would definitely not become a blacks reservation and would be open to all races. However, local residents are objecting to the proposal and have begun an intense campaign to lobby Wyong Sha Council into rejecting the park. Some have begun distributing literature forecasting dire health and social consequences for the area if the park is allowed to go ahead. Others are claiming the Budgie Boy School will become too big and local roads will not be able to cope with the increased volume of traffic. However, one local resident, Craig Hughes, um, the says Caribbean the real issue is, is really employment. racism. As a matter of fact, they're stating that it is a business venture. For who? It's no business venture for us. Could it be that the who is what's getting everybody so riled? Probably. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Two protest oh, meetings have already been and held this week and the friction continued this afternoon. So why can't they move by land and move into houses? It yeah. is racist, isn't it? But again, no, it's not. the average, course, average it's person not. who... But I went to both meetings and all of us have ours out, have ours yeah, out all the time. Why? Because she was agitated to see provoking it, even the council blokes. Even the council blokes were provoking Kevin Audette, who has lived, lived, lived in the area for most of his life, says he can't see any logical objection to the establishment of the park because the area is being promoted for tourism and the existing seven local parks are already well patronised. If I can't see any reason it can't be here, I, I, uh, I, I think it's well warranted, yeah. The local shops in, um, in the area, um, I think the whole business area would, would benefit by it, yeah. While on council maintain the development application is being processed normally and without bias. Darren Curtis for NBN News. Forget the national wage case. Newcastle City Council wants to give its two top employees increases far above the 6% granted to the man on the street. Town clerk Barry Lewis is set to receive a 20% increase, bringing his pay packet to $90,000. Throw in entitlements and he could be looking at around $124,000 per annum. As Director of Engineering Services, his colleague Doug Chapman is likely to command a reported $85,000, plus another $30,000 or so in entitlements. Uh, we've investigated very uh, thoroughly uh, the situation that exists in relation to other council areas, not only in New South Wales but in Victoria as well, and we find that, uh, that our 
particular uh, officers are not being paid commensurate with uh, the degree of responsibility they've got and uh, we've decided uh, that there's a need for an increase. Don Geddes is a member of the special committee which drew up the new salary package. The recommendations for a five-year performance-based contract for the top men were endorsed in principle last week by a closed meeting of council. There was, however, a voice of dissent over the pay hike. But nevertheless, it seeks to set a double standard in terms of implementing an increase of 20% uh, that's above and beyond any increases that are available to the average worker. And with the pilot's pay demands grabbing headlines nationwide, the proposed salary increase for top council staff earns little sympathy from the man on the street. I think it's disgusting. After all, the, the airline pilots are being criticised for their 30% increase. Why should the council get an increase? Why don't they give the workers some instead of giving them to the people who are getting a lot of money all the time? They're talking about the um, Air Force blokes and they turn around and give them these 20%, make them up to 124000 a year. Absolutely shocking. With politicians getting pay rises and uh, pilots, how about the average bloke in the street should get a substantial one too, if that's the case? I don't think it's justified in these, uh, these times. Oh, they're good fellows, those town clerks. I've been one myself, so you better give it to him. We might go otherwise. Councils are losing staff. We can't compete in the public sector and we can't compete uh, with the private sector. We are losing positions in the council and not able to fill them, important positions. Now we've got two very loyal officers who are stuck by us, who are very efficient officers, and who are entitled in my mind to some increase, particularly having regard to that loyalty, that efficiency, and the fact that they're prepared to stop with us. But before any contracts are signed, performance criteria and the more ticklish question of just who assesses that performance are still to be resolved. Leslie Robinson for NBN News. For these two boys, the routine of going to and from school is a long way from the excitement and magic of Disneyland. But for nine days next month, that's where both boys and their families will be. 14-year-old Michael and 12-year-old Luke have muscular dystrophy. As they get older, their muscles deteriorate. They don't have very long to live. The two friends have always wanted to visit America, and although they were a little shy about it today, their parents say they don't stop talking about the trip. Why do you want to go to Disneyland? Because it's my dream. Yeah. And I'd like to go to America to see it. A dinner and auction dance at the local hotel raised the $20,000 needed to send Luke, his parents and his little sister overseas. The Aboriginal community has raised $3,000 for Michael and his mother, however they still need another $2,000. The trip is not only important because it fulfils the two friends' dream, but it also brings the Aboriginal and white communities together. It's very important because these two young men have got a, a, a life expectancy which has been shorter as the years go on, around about the 20s, and uh, it's been their lifetime ambition and dream. And it's unique that uh, these two young men of the same health problems, uh, a Koori and a non-Koori, are coming together. And I think uh, the adults and the community as a whole can learn from it. 